So, Bob, I feel confident in saying that we can actually finish finish answering the questions from the survey we sent out a few months ago because there's not that many left. Actually, as I scroll through it, there are several left. But I feel like <laughs> there's a chance that we might be able to get through there's, it. What do you say, Bob? There's a chance. Hey, there's a chance. There's, a, there's always a chance. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. And I am your friend, Bob, from graduate school, a therapist in practice here in Seattle. Okay, so this first question is actually not from the survey. It's from Discord. Alex18 asked, what is your therapist superpower? For example, keeping a straight face or completing notes on time. Bob, do you have, I haven't thought about this, so I don't know what I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to answer this question, but well, actually, can I say what your, can I tell you yeah. what, oh, tell sure. you what your superpower this is? be good. Your superpower should not be surprising to the listeners. I mean, I've never been your client and I've never observed your work, but I can imagine what it would be like. And I would say that your superpower is to make people feel safe. I know it's kind of a general thing, that, but I think very, very safe. That's a big deal. Do you think that's true? Um, do I make people feel safe? I sure hope so. But I do you do you have an above average, a far above average ability to do that? Oh, I, well, I don't know. I've, I've never watched anybody else at work either, so I don't really know. Yeah. Carl Rogers is my, bench, my benchmark, so yeah. he makes people feel safe. I, if I could be just like that or close to that, that'd be good. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's my, what I would call my superpower. My superpower is storytelling. Oh. I'm, I, can, I can induce trance by just telling stories. Huh. It's to clients. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you mean by trance? Well, um, it, um, gaze inward, essentially, is what I mean. If you tell a good story, you evoke a bunch of images, and that makes people, instead of looking out through their eyes, they look inward into their imagination. That, that's what I would call inducing a trance. And if you're a good storyteller, which means you use good verbs, you can effect that. So, like, Sue Johnson's a pretty good storyteller. And she'll, with her clients, she'll, she'll be able to evoke an inner gaze. But she bristles at the notion that she's a trance inducer. She says, I do not induce trances. But I think, actually, an inner gaze is a shift in uh, consciousness, which you could just call a trance. Mm -hmm. But I, I love storytelling, evoking evoking imagery and um and therefore emotion to create a shift in perspective because i suck at trying to teach anything academically like just like conceptually so you're trying to guide them naturally to a paradigm shift rather than yeah. saying change your paradigm yeah interesting yeah and you know or you predict what sort of story and in what way to tell it would uh -huh. help them do that uh-huh can you give an example of that well i often use the burrito story did I ever tell you the burrito story? I don't know. Are you going to put me in a trance? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> so it was a Sunday. It was uh, afternoon on a Sunday. And we were having burritos in bed because we eat in bed a lot. And Colleen was telling me about her, her boss who was mistreating her. This is at the job she used to have. This is about 10 years ago. And uh, the boss is mistreating her. And, you know, she's, she's self-made. She went from bank teller at 19 to manager of her department and vice president in the bank and over those years, but she's a woman and working in a white man's privileged kind of industry. I don't know. I don't think I knew she was vice president. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So she had, she literally had three jobs and her colleague that was like at her same level, who was a white guy had just the one, the one job. And so she, you know, she has to perform, she has to overperform and she gets paid probably about 20% less than what he gets paid to do less work. And she gets, she has to do three jobs and gets paid less than him. So it's, it's what happens in America, right? So this Sunday afternoon, she's complaining about him and really angry. And I've heard her complain about this many, many times and understandably so, but um, I'm get, I get angry. So I'm, I'm sort of getting angry because I've given her really good advice and I'm a good therapist. So I give good advice, right? So I'm giving, I've given her really good advice and she doesn't take it most of the time, almost none of the time. And she's complaining about what I'm telling, saying it to myself is this, this is a completely solvable problem. Could you just solve it by doing X, Y, and Z about it as if that's the right thing. And I can feel myself boiling and I know it's going to happen. I'm going to pop. You're going to pop? Yeah. I'm going to pop. You're trying to help her to push back on the oppression. Yeah. And stand up for herself. 
Right. And she's sort of pushing back on your advice. Right. Yeah. Or just sort of ignoring it. And I've given the same advice many times. And God damn it, I'm a good therapist, right? So I can feel the anger starting to boil. And I know what's going to happen. And I don't want to have that day. So we're done eating. I grab her plate. And it's burrito day. So that means the plates get this sticky film on it. And I go in the kitchen and I start washing them. And it takes a while because of that sticky burrito film. And I know I don't want to pop. But I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm standing there for two minutes, which is good. Still not knowing what I want to do. Washing the plates off. Get them washed off. Got to do something. Pop, you mean like get angry at her? Yeah. And say you're not listening to me or something? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, God damn it. Why don't you just do what you need to do? I mean, I'm sick of hearing you complain about the same thing. Same thing. That's what the anger wants to kind of boil over and say. Hmm. And I don't want to do that because that's just a shitty day. So I... um get done the plates and I know I got to do something, but I don't know what it's going to be. So I go back in the bedroom and I end up at the foot of the bed and I'm just sort of standing there and she's sitting there and she looks at me and I started to cry and I said, is it okay if I don't fix it? And she says, well, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, the thing about me is I don't know why you're with me if I can't help you with your problem. Like, why would you even want to be with me? I'm not sure I shouldn't just get a suitcase and pack all my shit right now because if I can't help you with your problem, then what am I doing here? And she says, Bob, I didn't marry you because, and I'm crying while I say this. She says, I didn't marry you because you're good at solving my problems. I'm with you because I like you and you have a good sense of humor and we enjoy our time together. Those are the reasons that I'm here. And when I was saying all that stuff to her, I was listening to it because I actually didn't know that that was what the thing is. That all my anger wasn't to help her at all. Like I could solve misogyny. Like really, really I could do that. It was because I tell myself that I am my utility. And if I have no use, then I have no place. That I'm not lovable unless I'm useful. So for me, it's life and death. And what it sounds like is I'm a cranky person trying to give advice who, that doesn't get taken. But it's not, that's not it at all. And when I think about this shit, I think about the Wizard of Oz. You know, in the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy and the gang, they're standing in front of that booming voice and that face and the smoke and the flames and the whole thing, and they're scared to death. And the dog runs across the room, grabs the curtain and pulls it aside, and you kind of look over there and you see this doddering, vulnerable old guy back there. And he doesn't want to be seen. And he's a wizard. And so he pulls the curtain shut and he screams at them, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. And then you find out that that's the wizard. And the wizard actually doesn't have any power. None at all. Just a guy who doesn't want to be seen. I think everybody has a wizard inside them. I've got mine. Mine's about, you, I'm only lovable if I'm useful. And that part doesn't want to speak its own name and doesn't want to be seen or known. It feels really vulnerable for that to be exposed. But that's the part that pulls all the strings and all the levers and pushes me into behaviors and is usually beneath anger. And that's the wizard. And in couple therapy, part of my job, I see it as I see it, is to help people find theirs. So the story is really useful as a way to create, I hope create, interest and curiosity about who's behind someone else's curtain. So what kind of thing do you hear people say after you might tell them that story? No, oh, well, it's hard to say. I mean, everybody has their own response. Well, I could imagine there's a lot of elements there, you know, like you are butting up against some, a couple, you know, you're talking with a couple because all your clients are couples, right? Yeah. 95% nowadays. Which is really interesting. I have to say. I know. I know. It's um, just not what I was going to think. I didn't think that's what's going to happen at all. Yeah. Yeah. But I find couples to be oh, very me. interesting. Me too. And really interesting professionally yeah. and gratifying when things get better. Um, so you're working with a couple and you have say heterosexual relationship. The husband is the kind of things you'll say are like, you never listen to me. Right. You're always discounting me. You don't care about my feelings, but you might observe yourself as a therapist that what really is happening is that he is, you know, they're both overworked and he 
feels the distance and will pull away because he gets scared. And then that builds up over time. And his wife doesn't even really notice that he's getting upset because they're both busy. And then a week passes and then he just explodes with this anger or something. So then you tell the story and, and, and you're trying to help him with that. And he doesn't seem to be going along with what you're saying. He's, you know, you're like, well, what's really going on underneath there? It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, she's just distant all the time. And you're like, well, is it possible that you, you feel the distant and you're hurt by that? No, I'm not hurt by it. I just, it doesn't bother me, but she, you know, what she did that, you know, she, he's really focusing on something that she did yeah, on Saturday outside. or something sure. on that particular day. And you're like, okay, well, the didactic method isn't really helping. So I'll, I'll lay the burrito story on him. And the idea is, is that as he's hearing this, I can imagine he would be thinking, okay, well, this relates to me somehow. And it's a long enough and good enough story. And I'm listening and I'm like, okay, I can relate to that. And then he might shift and say like, okay, well, I guess, yeah. And also by you leading the way as a therapist, presumably if you have this problem, then it's okay to have that problem. Right? And then he says, hmm, I guess that is kind of what was happening with me. I was, I guess my wizard behind the curtain is I'm a, I feel alone. Mm -hmm. I feel like no one ever cares about me. And, mm -hmm. and what I'm doing with I'm pulling all the levers is I'm getting angry and whatever I do, you know, to aggravate my wife. And then he might be able to accept that in himself and potentially talk about it in the therapy office. That That's the that's idea. That's the point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who's the wizard inside? Yeah. And you noticed this a long time ago that this method was a good match for you? Yeah. I think I learned it from teaching DBT skills because hmm. uh, didactic teaching is really boring and yeah. I don't think I'm particularly good at it, but I can tell a story. Yeah. 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 I can think about Jay Haley and family therapy. He often talked about metaphor. And I think it's along these lines. Yeah. Obviously, self-disclosure is along these lines. I also think about, because I grew up pretty heavily Christian, and there was a lot of talk about Jesus's parables. Right. And that's the same thing. Same thing. And how, you know, you, he'll, someone will ask Jesus a question and he'll, instead of answering it directly, he says, well, let me tell you a story. And then right. he tells a story and it answers it better than if he had done it directly or is more convincing or right. more dem, 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 demonstrative of what he's trying to get across than, and who knows if he actually said those things. I mean, at least the people that wrote it down said he said those things. but. Right. But anyway, yeah, I'd say, okay. So you find that that when you think about the poignant, powerful moments in therapy, you point to moments like that for yeah, you. Yeah, story yeah. moments. Yeah, I mean, I can kind of relate, not, not to that degree, but the uh, analogy, which are basically little stories, you know. Um, yeah, they are. I, maybe that's what I'll say my superpower is, is that I... I never, and you know, I often talk about on the podcast that I will start an analogy without even knowing where I'm going. Oh, with the I know. Analogy. That's cool, isn't it? And I would say nine times out of ten, it it it, it works out, and right. maybe three times out of ten, I'm like, "Wow, that's a great analogy." Uh -huh. <laughs> One time out of ten, I'll get halfway through the analogy, and I'll be like, "Where was I going with this?" Right, because an image or a story or a situation will just pop into my head. And, right. and then of course, coming from a certain conceptualization, you would say, well, there's a deeper wisdom inside of me oh, that, that kind of knows without doubt that it fits. Like yeah. there's a vibe that fits and I'm just sort of exploring it to eventually find it that I already knew it or something. But I don't know about that. Sometimes I feel like there's a germ of that. Um, but I will find a way to make it work or something as I'm saying it out of my face. Cause that's the thing with these analogies, unless I will you, there's some analogies that I'll use over and over again right. because I found them to be helpful. But, but often when I'm talking on this podcast and as a therapist, I, it's a brand new analogy. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what's the chance that they're going to work out? But anyway, so yeah, I can, I can relate to that. And this is why when I will teach trainees and for y'all out there about what it takes to be a good therapist, you can't learn this in a book. No. You, you, can, you can learn it, uh, the, the sort of idea of it, but to become wise and convincing and inspirational is something that you have to develop yourself. And you have to find the charismatic core inside yeah. of you. Yeah. And I remember realizing that early. I, I don't know if it was one of those things, but I don't know if you remember me telling you that in my early career when I was at the agency, I would, at the end of a session, I would be like, ooh, I discovered a, a maxim of therapy. Right. I and I would write it down on a post-it note, right. and I would stick it on my poster board. And, uh, you know, seven out of ten of those of those post-it notes i couldn't decipher the next day I'd, i would look at the phrase I, i've it was like i was stoned and i wrote yeah. down like time is a circle or something and i i was like what was i th and I, it kind of bummed me out because i yeah. remember thinking it was right. like this brilliant sort of notion that i had discovered it uh -huh. was it was this really wonderful experience actually when i think about well it was frustrating because on one hand right. i i knew i didn't know the central features of what it took to be a therapist. I could feel that in my bones. You know, I could feel lost most of the time. Yeah. And then I would discover something and that would be this wonderful, it was like I was, I want to go on an analogy, like I was on an archaeology dig and I'm, I know there's something down there, but I'm just digging and digging and digging. Yeah. And, and there's times when I'm like, I, I don't think I'll ever find anything or I found everything there is. And all of a sudden, boom, I find this, uh, you know, this find. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And one of those things was to be a good therapist is to be inspirational or diplomatic. I remember, I think, oh, yeah. I, think I used the word diplomatic. Diplomatic. Which is um, a word that I would use f to describe to be convincing, yeah. to be to move people, you know, there's not a great, maybe move, yeah, move, ins inspire, um, like with the example I gave of the husband who is feeling distance but doesn't want to acknowledge it and will get angry by day seven. He doesn't want to look at his hurt for good reason, but and you could work on him for fifteen years and maybe get him there but it'd be much better if you could get him there faster <laughs> and to get him over that hump you have to fight with him you have to inspire him you have to be diplomatic with him because if you're straight with him you're like well honey i understand what's going on with you <laughs> you know you're you're hurt it's obvious to me you know i, I i'm a professional i've seen it many times and you say yeah that's not very diplomatic, right? But it's true. You, you could be that way. It's, Direct doesn't work like that. So how can you convince someone, right? You can't just back off and give up and just, you know, I guess you could in, if that's all that you have available to you. But it'd be much better if you could inspire them and really, you know, help them to, I don't know. It's just, you got, it's like changing someone from a Democrat to a Republican or vice versa. You're like, you're. You're trying to really change their mind about something. It's fundamental that they've always believed about themselves or about men or about life. You know, there are people out there that they literally don't think they ever get hurt. They literally think that it's weak or, or foreign to have their feelings hurt or something. And they've always felt that way and everyone around them felt that way. And so how do you change that? How do you get them to believe something different and the belief that i've never been hurt is a defense it's a shield yeah only way i ever got anywhere with anybody is to join them not try to not try to convince them of anything but to just simply join them which feels really threatening have you ever noticed that mm. it feels really threatening to join another but what i've discovered i was i can't remember what it was last week but this happens pretty regular nowadays is in joining with this client i get really uncomfortable i'm like oh shit i'm I'm going the opposite direction that I want to go. And I just wait. By join, what do you mean? Validate. But like in a way that makes them feel like you're with them. Oh, definitely join. Definitely be with them where they are. I, I'm, I'm picking on the word join because technically join, and it's one of my pet peeves, is, and I don't know where you got it from, but 
which my, I'm, I'm now wondering, because you're not from the family therapy world, so I'm, I'm like, not. why is he using the word join? Because that's a family therapy word that it really drives me nuts. And But you using it is like, well, he must have got it from some other arena that uses it in the way that he's defining it right now, which makes total sense because that's what it sounds like, right? It uh -huh. sounds like the way you're using it. But in the family therapy world, a lot of family therapists, including students of mine, will use it in the definition that you're using it right now, which is completely incorrect for a family therapist to use it that way, not only because it's wrong, but also because it, it flies in the face of what is a very important principle in family therapy, not in your field, Bob, because you're, you're not from that at all. And my field's a minority field anyway, compared to your field. Mm -hmm. well. And also, you're going to be tested on it. Like, this is something that would absolutely be on your national exam. So, you you know, it'd be one of those details. And as a family therapist, it's one of the first five things you should really understand, which is that when you join with a client, you are becoming a part of the system. You could use empathy as a part of that, but you're not, a lot of people will, you, in my you know, circle will use the word join as a stand in for the word rapport or relationship building, mm. which is, I think, the way you're using it. Mm. Which, well, it's a little different, right? Okay. It's more like yeah. um, the way it sounded like you're using it to be with someone, to be truly with them. It really means, to me, it means drop my position. Like if I'm holding collaborative fast, and yeah. I'm not, I don't have an agenda. Yeah. Right. You ever, you ever, I, I used to take Aikido back in the day. You know, Aikido is mm -hmm. the only martial art that has no offensive moves. Well, Judo. A judo has offensive moves, I think, but I don't know. It doesn't oh, okay. matter. The, 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 what they used to say is the person who grips is the person who will lose. That, that as long as you're not gripping, you won't, you won't, you can't uh, be thrown. I, they don't really say it like that, but, but that's, but that's basically what they mean. So, when I let go of my position, I let go of my grip on my position. Mm -hmm. That's a move of strength, not to overpower somebody, but actually quite the opposite, mm -hmm. to invite them into theirs, into their power or their momentum or their whatever, and be with them where they are. It feels really, really threatening. Mm -hmm. And every time I do it, my heart rate goes up and I'm like, uh-oh, something, I don't know what's gonna happen here, but, and then I can actually feel this shift in my brain mm -hmm. where, and I don't know how else to describe it. It happens just sometimes. And in the shifting, there's um, 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 an awareness of a way through mm -hmm. that I wouldn't otherwise have seen if I held tight to my position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And an ease to it and a natural helpfulness to it and a Rogers to it. And this is what Rogers was really interested in, you know, when, when people learn about Rogers, if, you, if you're not a therapist, one of the first things that all therapists will learn is Carl Rogers and his person-centered, client-centered therapy right. techniques. And often the takeaway is this very simple, yeah. uh, you know, lesson around active listening, essentially. Right. And repeating back to people what they're saying. Right. You know, a, a client says something like, I'm really sad today. And as a therapist, you say, I hear that you're saying you're really sad today. <laughs> and I'm just like, uh, yeah, that's, that's the principle. That's rather but, mechanical, but. Yeah, um, but if you are truly a phenomenological listener and truly in your sense joining and putting aside your agenda mm -hmm. and living in their world, mm -hmm. then your language will follow is yeah. the thing. And so it's the paradigm shift. It's not the mechanical, technical um, aspects of Rogers. Y you could do everything Rogers did behaviorally and completely fuck it up yeah. because the client won't feel it and right. you won't act natural. No. You know, that when you're, um, uh, if you're trying to actively listen, there's something desperately wrong with your approach as a therapist. Yeah. And this is true for every, you know, Everyone out there, whether you're a therapist or not, listening to someone, even if it's just this random person, like you're at a you're a McDonald's cashier and a customer has something to say, if you really take just two seconds and put aside your agenda and really listen to someone, if you've ever been a customer and you've had a complaint and someone 
really takes the time to listen, even if they don't comply, right? Yeah. This first step is, does this person that I have a potential conflict with really get me? Yeah. Then if you really get the person and you say, I get you, I hear you, I'm with you, and the, the customer understands that, and you say, and yet I can't do anything about it because of the following reason, you're going to find so much better results because they're right. like, oh, well, they they get me. Yeah. And now they're telling so, you know, it, it applies. And in, in, in another venue that I'm reminded of is improv and improv oh. therapy. Yeah. The yes and bit. Yep. Which, if you do mechanically, is one thing, but if you really embody right. the yes and, yes and, where you're really, because yes and isn't just saying yes and, uh -huh. it's it's while you're listening, you're entering their world completely, yeah. and you're yep. and you're putting aside your own agenda completely. Like right. you're, you're, it's a very different way of being. It's a very different way of. I'm sure Buddhists have all sorts of language around this as well. Probably, Living yeah. in the moment, really, that's what it is, right? You're, yeah. you're not thinking ahead in improv. You're you're living in the moment. Right. You don't have a plan. It's it's to suffer <laughs> to, to have a plan. It's also counter to the flow of energy that's happening right then. And as a good therapist, to truly listen and to truly be with someone is a very powerful thing. I've talked about this before, but with my dissertation, I did a phenomenological qualitative study and I uh, used phenomenological techniques, interviewing techniques with 10 seasoned psychotherapists as they talk about difficult clinical moments. And the phenomenological technique as a methodology and research is to get at the lived experience of the participant. Right. You're, as a researcher, really trying to avoid influencing the participant. You're really trying to avoid even having an agenda that would influence how you interpret the data that you're getting or the questions that you ask. So as a researcher, I would really have to enter that space. And it gave me this permission to do so. And because as a therapist, I find that a lot of us feel like we have to do something. We have to analyze. We have to interpret. And there's nothing terribly wrong with that, of course. I do that all the time. But I think if we do that too much, we can deny the central feature of healing and of therapy and of change, which is phenomenological listening. I, I tell people that you could only phenomenologically listen as a therapist your entire career and do nothing else and probably be the best therapist in town. <laughs> like, uh, honestly, and, and, uh, this is one of those th talking about trying to convince people I would have to convince my trainees, you know, cause they would just say, well, I'm just listening. I'd say, and I'd, you know, I'd be like, oh, take the just out, <laughs> take that, take that gift. fucking just out of that sentence. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to ever hear that again. You're not just listening. That's like saying a surgeon is just cutting out the cancer or the bricklayer is just laying bricks the bricklayer is laying bricks the therapist is listening the yeah. therapist is not just listening the plumber doesn't just fix the leak the plumber goddamn fix the leak because that's their job it's our job to listen it's our job to fully fully listen and when we as clients feel fully heard and fully understood it it one is just a cr incredibly healing and satisfying to us, but also things change within us. We're able to, we're free from the shackles of opposition and of agenda. And we can, as clients, as client centered therapy is designed to do, we can begin to actualize ourselves. We're, we're freer to be able to grow and to explore and to be like, okay, now that I have this secure base of someone that cares and is really listening and and I don't detect any agenda from them that I have to go with or oppose or something or or hear, I'm I'm fully in my world. You know? It's like you're trying to re <laughs> here comes an analogy. <laughs> You're trying to uh, decorate your house, but you're constantly having to answer the door and listen to other people's ideas instead of just sitting in your living room and looking around the house and thinking about how would I like it to be? You know, that that's what phenomenological listening is, is. It gives you the time without anyone knocking on your door for you to just 
sit in your living room and look around and brainstorm yourself or talk with your family. And it gives you a chance to really just be yourself, explore yourself, think for yourself and grow for yourself instead of having to grow in a way that someone else wants you to or grow in opposition to someone else because they're in your way or something, you know? So that's what just listening is like. But anyway, so before we go to break, um, and we've only been to one question and we're halfway <laughs> done. Yes. Um, is joining is the structural and strategic idea, which is the foundation of our field, where the therapist tries to very quickly, quote unquote, join with the system. And you can actually join a system by being unempathetic and being bad with rapport if the system needs you to be that role. The phrase that I will use is when you're joining a system, you're becoming a member. You are, you have a role in the family and it might not necessarily be a good listener, but you're trying to figure out because the idea was, and I don't know if it's always true, but in order to affect a system, you have to be a member of the system. So if the, if the system needs a scapegoat, for example, and a very quick way for you to join and a helpful way for you to join is to become the scapegoat, meaning the one that everyone blames for all your problems, then that's what you do. That's how you join a system. But you're using join in this different way, which I also like. Anyway, so let's take a break, Bob, and then let's actually go fast. What do you say? <laughs> All right, Bob, we're back from the break. Let's do an OPP. These people became patrons all the way back in July of 2020. We wow. have RN, who is even an even more deserving listener from Bothell, Washington. Wow, Bothell. Uh, did you know Bothell had a sign, or still does, that uh, when you enter Bothell, Bothell is just north of Seattle. The sign says, stay for a day or stay forever, or something Come like that. Come for a day, stay forever. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah, stay for a day or stay forever. Doesn't that sound a little ominous? It does sound a little ominous. Though, you know, I'd never really been to Bothell, just that little downtown area off of... Um, Have you ever been in there? Have you ever stopped in the downtown area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had couple therapy there for yeah. a couple years, three years, actually. Oh, okay. Adam from Lafayette, Louisiana. Amy from God knows where. Aline from Menlo Park, California. Esther from Budapest. Robin. Oh, good old Robin. My student. <laughs> from wait wait that must be a different robin because that uh she's in newcastle great britain no oh. but spelled exactly the same and with the same last name as a student of mine oh. does she now live in great britain that's exciting Nell from pennsylvania anthony from god knows her anna from si an upper tier patron from si bob si? yes take a guess S S uh, S is it a city no it's a country si singapore it is slovenia slovenia Karen from Grand, Grand Blanc, Michigan, or Grand Blanc, Michigan. Josephine from God Knows Where. Khalees from Oklahoma City. Anna from God Knows Where. Ruzkowski from Pueblo, California. Angela from Fairfield, California. Paige from Marietta, Georgia. Nicole from Atlanta, Georgia. Laura from New York. Teresa from D Germany. I always see D-E, and I always want to say like Denmark, but... Right. D.E.'s Deutschland. Deutschland, right? yeah. Sarah from God Knows Where, Lisa from Philly, and Jill from God Knows Where. Thank you for becoming a patron and staying patron. Staying a patron through thick and thin. You know, whenever we do these OPPs, I always wonder, like, does anyone care as I do this? Because when I listen to podcasts, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to hear this part. It's kind of boring. But occasionally people will say, oh, my God, I heard my name. And yeah. that's the whole thing. Because yeah. when I when I hear my name, if yeah. I'm a contributor to a podcast, right. which I do, and I hear my name, it's just kind of a, it's kind of nice. Yeah. Right? I heard my name. Where? On here. Oh, right. <laughs> Earlier this episode. No, I know what you're saying. Leia. Okay. Real speed round. I have the Oh, the we're going to try it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to actually use the timer... After I read the question, right. Leia, how would you handle a not very close friend or acquaintance talking to you about things that seem like paranoia or delusions? Can you tell them that they're saying sounds odd and that you're concerned or, oh, can you tell them that what they're saying sounds odd and that you're concerned or would you just make them feel further or would that just make them feel further isolated? Bob, what do you think? Um, 
you believe that they have a delusion and yeah i think it's okay to say that's not your experience of things that you're experiencing it differently um they may or may not have any insight that we're, we're sort of made to believe what we think so they may not um recognize that they have the thing i mean you could actually argue that for all of us we all have maybe not like delusions in the form of psychosis but beliefs that um aren't based in reality you may not be thanked for it in the immediate but maybe it'll have a an impact down the road yeah it completely depends on how symptomatic the individual is and how open they are i mean every person who has paranoia or delusions is different of course and there's different degrees even among individuals and the cycle of symptoms that they're going through but if they're particularly paranoid and delusional even as a therapist it wasn't very helpful for me to oppose them because they're going to believe what they're going to believe yeah. and they they need a different kind of help than people t telling them that there's something odd with the way they're thinking having said that there were situations when I would oppose because I would, it's all about whether or not you predict the person would actually hear you or not and whether or not it'd be helpful because you could actually uh, alienate them yeah. by opposing them. The other thing is, is that if they are saying something that's particularly dangerous, you know, like my neighbor's out to get me, I, I bought a gun. Like you should, even if you're going to get some pushback, you should say, no, no, yeah. <laughs> that's, do not. Do whatever you can, of course, calling the authorities and or your the person's therapist would be in order at that point. Anonymous says, can the way parents focus their energy on different children lead them to developing different attachment styles? While listening to the deep dives, I was surprised how me and my three siblings seem to be in two camps. Me and my older brother seem to be mostly avoidant, while my younger and older sister exhibit mostly preoccupied attachment so, Bob, how can that happen? Oh, it's common for people to have different experiences uh, growing up in the same family, even of the same events. And yeah, um, the relationships that parents have with their kids aren't necessarily the same. There can be favoritism. I mean, not everybody's going to be loved equally in all families. It's just... Do you, you know, think you have different attachments in your family? Different attachment styles? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know if we've ever yes. talked about this before. yes. Do you feel comfortable talking about it? Well, um, I don't like talking about other people like that haven't you know given me permission. But I can say that oh. um, the all three attachment and security styles are present in my family among my sibs. Right. Yeah. Uh, in brief, I would say uh, just to piggyback on what Bob is saying that. People are born with different dispositions. They're also born into a different family. For example, if you have two older siblings who are both preoccupied and you enter the family, there's a chance that you might edge towards avoidant because that's a role in the family that you can fill because you notice that your, par the, your parents might be a little overtaxed by your preoccupied older siblings. And so you might want to, you might actually get some additional love by actually being different and being more calm and more non-invasive or something. Um, so uh, there's a lot of factors that play into once. And plus each individual has different experiences outside the family. Yeah. So, but I think a lot of it does has to have to do with those two things is the, uh, disposition because you know if someone's a little bit more sensitive or someone's a little bit more introverted or right. someone's a little bit more perceptive or someone's you know there's different dials that we enter the world with that are turned up or turned down yeah. and then and then also the family we enter is you know we often will think about parenting but really we should always think about the entire the family entire system yeah. system yeah yeah for, for example for me my older brother and sister played a huge role in raising me because they were seven years older and were expected to take care of me, particularly my sister. And so, um, I, and I often don't actually acknowledge that enough. Um, and, but I remember when I was say three or four years old, I remember thinking I basically had two sets of parents. I mean, cause my older brother and sister were so much older than me. I, I considered them to be yeah. 
uh, just as helpful and important in my life, you know what I mean? MFT intern Justine from Nevada says, Dr. Kirk and Bob, do you ever get tired or bored with doing therapy? Not bored with the client, but just in general, because it can get repetitive. So again, this is from an MFT intern, Justine from Nevada. Bob, do you ever get bored with doing therapy? I can't say I do get bored. I think if I do get bored, though, it means that I'm avoiding something. It's a countertransferential response, yeah. and it probably means I'm avoiding. But I find my work generally pretty interesting, stressful at times. And, you know, I can't say I love going to work every day that I go to work. Um, sometimes I want to not go to work, but I don't find it boring, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, this is such a big question. But, and I don't think I've ever really answered it before, but... Yeah, you know, I've been a therapist for 25 years. Have I been bored in therapy before? Absolutely. Have I been bored with my career in general? Yeah. In fact, when I started this podcast 14 years ago, all I was doing was uh, being a therapist. I had quit being a professor because it was so stressful and it was um, prior to me being sucked back in <laughs> and being a full-time professor which I enjoyed more than being a part-time. But anyway, I was, uh, that's all I was doing. And I, I worked basically four shifts of 10 hours, Monday through Thursday. Sometimes on Thursday, it'd be like a half shift. But, you know, I was seeing 30 clients a week. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling really, and, and I'd finally achieved my goal, which was, you know, fully paying private practice clients coming to my office because I was doing a lot of in-home therapy. And although I liked that, it was uh, logistically harder for me because I'd have to drive to the yeah. house and da, da, da. Yeah. And so I had finally re realized my career um, a few years earlier and I'd had a few years of that. And I found that some Sunday nights I would kind of dread oh, yeah. uh, that week. Right. Not because I'd dreaded any particular client there there was I, I remember and i remember thinking that i'm like well is there a client that's and i'm like no each i like work I, there's no client that i dread working with what's going on here and i i think it's just what you might be experiencing justine which is if you're just doing wall-to-wall -wall therapy throughout the week i think it's just kind of it, be, it becomes I, I think it's like doing this it's like let me give it a story. Oh, a story. So my mom, when she had a daycare, she changed a lot of diapers. There were a lot of kids who wore diapers. And, and she developed carpal tunnel from changing diapers. Damn. Because there was a certain movement that she would do repetitively throughout the day as she's right. changing the diapers. And she had to have surgery. And um, so it's, it's along those lines. I think it's a repetitive yeah. Uh, emotional, intellectual activity that your brain can only do so much of in a week. And that's why I find the happiest therapists who can sustain their career long term, they do a number of things throughout the week. Um, like for me, I've, all, you know, since 14 years or 13 years ago ish, I, when I became full time at the university, I've always had a mix of, uh, you know, university work therapy, supervision, podcasting. I guess that's all that I do, right? And I, yeah. other kinds of things. Yeah. But even the university was varied because there's teaching and then there's admin stuff. Right. And so I would really have uh, throughout the day just a variety of things that I was doing and I right. never got tired again of once I became once I had that mix. Yeah. I was never I never had that experience on Sunday night. I, I, I never was like, oh, I have to see clients all week. I, I never had that feeling again. Um, even when I was working myself to the bone, going to full time, I was getting a full time doctorate. I was a full time professor, administrator. I had a pretty robust practice. I was in a band. I was doing the podcast. Sunday night, I didn't I didn't. Um, dread. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I loved it, you know. So, um, so I think that's part of it. The other thing that I'll say about boredom and therapy is I have absolutely been bored sometimes with with particular kids. So that sounds terrible to say, but there are some kids that are really kind of forced into therapy, and mm -hmm. or they don't really know what therapy is. Mm -hmm. There are some kids that absolutely participate um, and are 
I, I will completely lose track of time when I'm working with some kids. Um, and we'll be doing deep work and or we'll just be playing with Legos, but I'll consider it to be therapeutic or it is therapeutic in my mind. And that's not boring, but there are some clients where, like I remember there was one, there's just one client that pops into my mind and she would, she loved to draw, but she did not want to interact. And she, so a lot of kids they'll draw, but they'll want to have an exchange or something. Or if I pay attention to their drawing, I can tell that they care that I'm there. There was, I, I'd, I'll never forget this one kid. She was seven years old ish and she loved to draw and she would draw these very elaborate pictures, but I never got the impression that she cared that I was there. Like truly not that she was trying to, you know, push me out or that um, she was acting like she didn't care. Cause certainly there's, there's all that aspect to some kids. I, I think she just, really did not want me there and mm -hmm. I would get I would get pretty bored you know because really even just after three minutes of that especially me I'm kind of impatient that I would I would just be like oh, there's another you know 50 minutes of this it, it, was, it was I remember getting pretty bored with that so there are certain clients again kids because if you had an adult that really just didn't want to be in therapy, you'd have a conversation with them and maybe terminate, right? But with kids, it's sometimes impossible to have those kinds of, kinds of conversations because you don't know. You don't know if it's going to take them six months to open up because sometimes that happens. Right. But you don't know if they're ever going to open up and you can try all these different things. And again, I'd say that's rare, but I'll tell you that, oh, that was extremely boring. <laughs> like... Ugh, really looking at the clock with clients like that. <laughs> um, I mean, just to give you another sort of uh, very poignant example of this, this is when I was first starting my private practice. This was my very first private practice client, oh, and wow. I was um, doing in-home therapy with this client, and it was a teenage boy, and he really didn't want to be in therapy. And the entire session, he acted like he was sleeping, even though he wasn't. He laid down on the couch, closed his eyes, refuse to talk and I'm like trying to earn my money. I'm trying to be a good therapist now, or even just a few years later, I would have terminated right then and there. I'd be like, I'd go to the parents and be like, so he's acting like he's sleeping and you know, no harm, no foul. He, I, I, I get that you want me to talk to him because he has these behavior problems, but we all got better things to do. So unless you can somehow convince him, because I did everything I could and it didn't work and you know, I realize this is not the best thing you want to hear, but I don't, I, none of us, you're going to be wasting your money. I'm going to be wasting my time. He's going to be bothered. So I, I did what I could call me when you convince him to actually kind of participate in therapy. But back then I'm like, yay, I'm in private practice, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 and it was funny cause I think I've said this before. I, I, I charged thirty five dollars wow. for a session that was an hour long, yeah. and it took me an hour commute. Right. So for, but I was making more money than I, I was probably two or three times more money than I was at my agency. Anyway. Right. All right. Nancy says, "What did you decide to study? When did you decide to study psychology and specifically become a therapist?" Bob. Uh, I was nineteen. I went to a therapist. I sat in the session for an hour and cried. And during that, I thought, oh, I think I could probably do this for a living. This is your first session? Yeah. Wow. No, I was, was I 20? I was a freshman in college. So why'd you go to therapy? Oh, it was a career counselor. And they said, I was in this class for kids who didn't know what they want to be when they grow up and what like they want to study or, or college? major. No, it's college. Freshman year, college. And they said, well, we have this career counseling, you know, block here. And if you guys want to talk to one of these folks, you can. I'll never forget it. Paula Ann Pricken, she was lovely. I saw her for eight weeks. So wait, you, you sit down in the first session. You think you're just going to talk about careers. Just there to try to get a handle on that shit. And then how did you end up getting to where you got? Crying. Um, she just left the room open. She just left it open to do whatever it wanted to be. Wow. So I don't think I've ever heard this story before. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, I cried for an hour and during well, the wait, I'm, I'm really, I mean, it's a long time ago. It was yeah, 1988 or something or something. 1987. Somewhere. And so you're a 
it's, you know, it's hard, but you, you're, you have a memory. I've never met someone that has a memory like you do. Oh, wow. But you're also very, you know, memory and intelligence are related, IQ and memory. In sure. fact, you could argue a good portion of the IQ construct and measurement is based on memory. Memory, yeah. So it doesn't surprise me. But so when I ask this question for anyone else, I'd be like, well, how would you know? But I'm guessing you actually do remember. But what do you think happened there? Because that's a that's an amazing moment in your life and oh, yeah. in that was pivotal. my life and in because we never would have met otherwise. That's true. And in the lives of all your clients wow. and in the life of, you know, we've talked about before how if you hadn't become a therapist, your self-awareness regarding attachment and, and all this stuff oh, man. probably would have been a lot more diminished. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it changed the listeners' lives because they never would have met you. Oh, wow. So... I think this moment is because before the session, you had never thought about becoming a therapist. I was taking pre-engineering classes because the credits will apply to any degree you need. If you get, you got to take a math class, take calculus. Cause if you want to be an engineer, then you can use that. But if you want to be a psychology major or a philosophy major, you can still apply the credits. So I just took the science, the pre-engineering science classes for the first year of school and you know, I didn't have any interest in any of that. But I, and, and you're like, I don't know if I want to be an engineer, so maybe I should go to this career counselor. Well, I took a class for kids who didn't know. It was this class to kind of develop your, you know, um, uh, sense of yourself, so mm -hmm. that you could choose a major. And so you 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 sit down. Uh -huh. You're starting to talk. How do you get to that plate? Like what? She created an open space, she did. She's, and you just stepped into it. Yeah, she did. She I don't remember how she introduced it, but she brought me into her office. It was this really nice kind of small room. She had um, uh, shelves in the corner with books on them, and they were like planks with bricks, you know, three bricks stacked mm -hmm. up in a plank. I remember just staring at the bricks for most of the, most of the time I went there. And um, I don't know if she said, you know, we get to use this time for whatever it wants to be, or if she said... Um, you know, what's going on with your school or whatever, but she did not focus me on anything career related. She was a, I think she was a psychology student, a graduate student. Um, and what did you talk about? Do you, do you remember? I didn't talk about anything. You just I, cried. I just cried for an hour. I literally cried for an hour. So didn't, you didn't say a story that provoked crying. No, nope. you just started crying. I just sat down. And whatever it is that she said, she said, and I did not utter a word for an hour. And I just wow. Sobbed. So she says, "Look, this is an open space. Yep. We can talk about whatever you, whatever want, you to. want to. So let her rip. Do whatever you want to. Yeah. And you just sobbed. I literally sobbed. For did an you hour. say anything before sobbing? No. You didn't say anything. No. Oh my God! So you sit down. She says whatever, and then boom! This so obviously you were had a lot of pent up tears. Yeah, and at the end, the hour was up, and she said, "Do you want to come back?" And I said, "Yeah," and that was it. And that was when you decided you I wanted thought, to come. During that time, I thought, "Well, maybe I could do this." Oh my she's God! That is, I mean, and, not many people have a story like that. I mean, that is cinematic yeah that was a hell of a moment if i saw that in a movie i'd be like well come on i mean that that's going a little far that's what happened to me that's amazing yeah that's amazing i think i that's was amazing of you to do at that age you know that because it's that's a very brave i mean did you you did you feel okay doing that no, I think I felt really self-conscious about it. And um, Were you trying to stop crying? I don't remember that. I just remember thinking that this was weird, and I don't even know what these tears are, and am I faking them? I <laughs> like I could. <laughs> uh, but also, just this is where I'm at. Did you have a sense of what you were sad about? No. No idea. Yeah. I mean, we know now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did you have an idea of what therapy would look like prior to sitting down? Like no. you're like, "Oh, I know it. I saw a movie once in which someone 
cried. No. Man, you must have had the dam was ready to burst. Must have been clearly. Yeah, <laughs> I was. I was nineteen, and she, she's just like, "Hey, whatever you want to talk about." Boom. Yeah. Sob. Yeah. Right. Which also says, "My God, I mean, the fact that." no one ever did that for you just said hey what do you want to talk about no no one ever did that for me wow wow yeah she was really lovely so right there then and there and then more sessions and you actually would say things yeah yeah and yeah, cry. I saw for eight weeks and yeah um why only eight weeks is that's all because that that's that was all the school year right and then i went home for the summer wow and uh did you tell your family that you were switching? I didn't have a major. I didn't declare. So that was what I did when I left school that summer, that spring or whatever, and went home. I switched my major to psychology, and that was I was a psych major from my sophomore year on. I don't want to derail you with your current novel, but you should write a short on that story. That's the first chapter of my novel. But you should write it from, I mean, unless it's an identical situation you should write a short autobiographical piece or a even a journal entry or something because that should get posted somewhere why i want to read it oh and i think people out there would like to read that huh do you think i should just write a autobiographical version of it yeah even if it's just like two pages hmm. it probably wouldn't be but mm. The, um, I mean, you know, you are in a sense, you and I are in a sense mm -hmm. in the modern version of people like Irvin Yalom and those authors, oh, you know, in the old Yalom. days you wrote books because that's the way you got the word out today. You yammer into a microphone and you post it on the internet. You know, I mean, really. Um, in in fifty years, this form of publication will be completely normalized. Oh. Uh, it, it's becoming that way in our field. It, in modern society, it's completely normal. You know, well, mostly normal. But I mean, I still have relatives that say, "How's your blog going?" But um, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. I mean, they're just not into that kind of thing. Yeah. But. Uh, I, you know, Irvin Yalom would have uh, a chapter or something, yep. about a piece about a moment like that in his life. You know, he, he wrote an autobiography. I actually talked with him on my podcast about his autobiography, he at wrote? least his most recent one. Was it, that wasn't the gift of therapy. It was something no. more recent. It, it was published three or four years ago. Oh, I should look it up. Yeah, I have it. It's, it you can borrow. It's good. Thanks. Um, real quick read it, it's like one or two page chapters or three or four page chapters and just like little snippets of his life and so he, was big, he was a big gambler as a as a as a young person yeah you told me that yeah, yeah. which I, I always, i'm always fascinated with stuff like that where you hear about because you don't it doesn't fit the no, the stereotype of a master therapist, yeah. you know, that he was like really into gambling wow. in, in New York City. I think it was. Anyway, did he talk about Olive Smith? Uh, I don't remember. She was his training analyst. He talked about how he worked with Viktor Frankl. Wow, really? And how he didn't like him very much. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, that's an amazing story, Bob. I'm pretty sure you've never really told me that story. Uh -huh. I mean, that is just incredible i can't uh if do you believe in god no if you did there'd be something in there about god oh <laughs> you know yeah some sort of like an angel from heaven comes down and asks you how are you doing and then uh, you know whatever she was a blessing paula Amprican. so my version of that story is is extremely lighter and i won't tell it again but i had never decided to become a therapist same age 19 i uh, but i wanted therapy because i had a friend of mine who had gone to the university clinic and it was 15 dollars a session because that was the whole thing it was like 
I couldn't afford yeah. to go to real therapy or, you know, so there was a, a perk for, you know, as a part of your as tuition, yeah. you know, and it was hall health. So they had physicians as, as well. Yeah. So, you, you know, cause a lot of the kids didn't have insurance. Right. Um, and you could also get therapy there. And so for $15 and I would pay with my own money and I, um, really liked it, but I also felt like I liked it cause he was listening but I didn't like it because he didn't really say anything. He was kind of a classic psychoanalyst mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, preferred not to say anything. <laughs> and when I pushed him on it, he's like, well, what do you want me to say? And I'd be like, I don't know. I've been telling you my life story for the past. What do you think? He's like, well, what do you want me to think? That kind of thing. And I don't know. That's, that's really bugged me. Yeah. Um, so he also self disclosed. He also he also told me about another one of his clients, like details, and I was mm. like, I didn't know at the time, but I remember feeling like, what's going? He also sat behind his desk. Imagine that, like, so I'm on, I'm in a real crappy kind of chair against the wall by the door, and he's all the way across the room behind this giant work desk, and uh, unbelievable. But you know, he he listened, and he was a good listener. And, yeah. Uh, but anyway. That sort of stuck with me, and mm. then later on is when it sort of popped into my head. But so mine's a much less cinematic, interesting story than yours. Um, and when I decided was when I was in uh, traffic. Yeah, and I was thinking about the rest of my life. You were on the uh, you were on the five twenty, right? Yeah, I've told that story many times. Katie says. What are your thoughts on couples just letting things... Go? Actually, let's take a break first, Bob, and then we sure. come back. More questions. Yep. All right, back from the break. Katie says, what are your thoughts on couples just letting things go? My husband and I are both very conflict averse and struggle to say when we're upset until resentment builds up. In couples therapy, I asked about practicing with bringing up smaller hurts oh in couples therapy i asked about hey let's let's practice actually not avoiding and we'll bring up smaller hurts but our couples therapist said that she tells all couples if it's at all possible to let something go then they should actually let it go but now i feel like any progress we made toward communicating our feelings is lost as though we've been given permission to go back to quiet anger any thoughts bob if it were a couple I were seeing and one of them said that they wanted to practice bringing up small hurts, I would ask about who's the wanter inside. And I would be thinking, you want contact. And I would want to be facilitating that you want contact, that there's meaning to you, that, that the thing that you're describing is a means to an end that really matters to you. Mm. And I'd be wanting to get you to connect with that and speak that to your your partner um are you saying that you would worry without that they would just be uh poking at each other or something um or complaining unnecessarily without any kind of purpose yeah i am saying that okay. that's exactly what i'm saying um because she doesn't want to talk about stuff because that's fun she doesn't want to talk about it because you know well, presumably because it'll resolve something, that's probably the goal. But what what what's left in the what what actually gets resolved? What what's there between them? There's something that's really wanted here. That's something that's really important. So I'd be encouraging her to connect with whatever that is and um, disclose that to her partner mm -hmm. that she wants more contact, probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Katie, it sounds like your therapist missed the mark, and I would tell your therapist about that say i felt like you are now telling us that we should be more pathological or something <laughs> um uh, what do you think about that so i would absolutely tell your therapist and you know your therapist could have just misunderstood or something uh and there are so there are two sides this one is is katie you're right that uh, given the way you frame it that would have been a wonderful activity to do to try to help the two of you feel safe and practiced and in a routine of not bottling things up, right? Because um, you say that resentment builds and then it explodes, right? So having little 
communications about smaller hertz would ab- absolutely be helpful along those lines. Having said that, and this isn't in, t- in opposition to you, Katie, but I have learned in my life, personally and professionally, that sometimes it is easy, it is more functional, depending on the style of relationship you want to have, to quote unquote, let smaller hurts go. Um, in my current marriage, I find that to be a, an important um, premise and foundation. Um, I, I know my wife does that with me. She will be hurt, smaller, minor things, and she just doesn't bring it up. She just lets it go. And I know that she doesn't resent it. It's, it, it doesn't stick with her. She doesn't bring things up later on. She doesn't say, well, there was that thing that happened. Like she never does that. She's just really, and I've actually admired that in her and learned how to do that. Now you can, obviously you can take that too far, but I think that there are times when that absolutely is a good route to take to just be like, well, it feels really bad right now, but you know, I'll give it a couple of days. If it still feels bad, I'll do something about it. But often in a couple of days, I will forget it like truly, truly, actually not just submerge it, but actually, actually forget it. Or it'll be so transformed that it'll just seem kind of irrelevant to bring up or something. And so there is some wisdom to what your therapist is bringing up, but obviously, but I think the application of that wasn't particularly good. So I would talk with your therapist. Simona says, could you discuss false memories, especially false autobiographical memories and false memory OCD? So I'll, I'll just take this one. Yeah, do I, this I, one. Yeah. I looked this up. So false memory OCD is someone who has a disorder, a obsessive compulsive disorder, but it manifests in being convinced that they've done something wrong despite no evidence of these memories being true. Oh, yeah. So like, did I, did I steal from my friend and I just don't remember it. Like I I have a vague memory kind of, and you can kind of become convinced of things and, and OCD is, it just ravages your soul. It's just the worst thing. And, and so it's, if you've never had it, it sounds kind of odd. Like, well, just tell your, tell yourself you didn't do that, but it's this massive intrusive thought and anxiety and distress. And it, it, there's, almost no way to relieve it, you know, and, and once you relieve that, another one pops, another one in. pops in. So anyway, um, discussing false memories, I've made whole episodes on false memories and repressed memories and su- suppressed memories and recalled memories. So I won't go over that again, but generally speaking, it's a complicated thing. And the way it's often talked about in our society is extremely simplistic. Even in my field, there are people who be like, there's no such thing as repressed memory. And I'm like, well, it depends on what you mean by repressed memory. <laughs> like, uh, and yes, you can create false memories in therapy. Um, so yeah, I've, I've talked about it, that at Dossi, but other episodes. Laura says, beyond giving it a shot for a couple sessions, beyond giving it a shot for a couple sessions, what are some questions to ask a, oh, I see. So when you're trying out a couple's therapist, besides actually just going to a couple sessions, what are some questions to ask a couple therapist during an intake session to know whether they are a good fit? I know, I know how to do this for my individual therapy, but I'm not sure how we should approach couple therapy. Thank you, Bob. What, what sort of questions can they ask either on the phone prior, over email, or in person to gauge whether or not they're a good fit? You can always ask for an elevator speech. How would you help? Or what's your philosophy of helping Mm -hmm. Um, a good couple therapist? uh, I have worked to develop an elevator speech so that I can talk about it intelligently. And that's really useful, not just for my clients, but also just for me to have a sense of my own. What is it? My elevator speech? Yeah. Oh, crap. I'm going to botch it now that you've got me on the spot here. Um, My elevator speech. Uh, okay, well, the kind of work I do is um, based on attachment theory. Attachment theory has to do with the humans are herd creatures, like turtles, little turtles are born and they look like big turtles. They have their everything they need to survive. And humans, we don't really have that. We, we are herd creatures. We survive because we live in groups. And what that means for us when we're born is that we form attachments. And the attachments we form are... Um, to kind of get a sense that there's a home office to check in um, check in on and also to explore the world from. And that 
attachment develop the attachment humans developing attachment isn't just what takes place between parents and kids that as adults we form attachments and in this culture um generally with a romantic partner or a, um, like a spouse or something like that um and your experience of conflict isn't it's not really about sex or money or how to raise the kids or you know religion or politics or whatever it's usually what's happening is something underneath so so if a couple is fighting about money chances are what they're fighting about is a sense of safety and or connection with one another and that they're scaring one another um they may be arguing ostensibly about money but what's happening um is they're sending emotional messages back and forth to one another that are twanging their insecurities and um so the more i say withdraw because i'm not getting my point across and because it doesn't seem like you're listening that behavior itself is actually sending a really strong emotional message to my partner which is probably scaring my partner maybe it's making my partner think uh oh he's or she's going away from me they're going away from me they're pulling back I better pursue, I better, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you doing? And then, you know, maybe I focus on their behavior and, you know, the way they spent money last week and, you know, how they spent money yesterday or whatever. And that's like my body's way of trying to forge a sense of connection to get my partner to engage with me. But the more I do that, the more I scare my partner into withdrawal. And so the more one withdraws, the more one pursues. And that dynamic is really distressing. And when it happens a lot, it can feel like it's the relationship. I often tell couples, I ain't here to help you with your relationship that's fine. I'm only here to help you with your conflict cycle. And if it's a lot, then it starts looking like it's the relationship. And that's when people find a guy like me. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's very convincing. Thank you. And demonstrative of your work. And I imagine that that would really paint a picture for clients to make him have an idea of what sort of work you do. And hmm. that would help them to know whether or not you're a good fit. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're a therapist listening out there, develop that. It's practice. Bob, didn't just he wasn't born with that years elevator speech he thought about it years and talked about it and thought about it and talked about it and thought about it and talked about it yeah and developed it and so uh, you want to have something like that yeah it's a good um, idea not only to convince people of what you're doing and not only to help people understand what you're doing but also to have an elevator speech that is true to you is yep. to have a model of thinking yes. that is at the ready and is your foundation of how you interpret the world so yeah. that you you have a guide, you have some way of behaving and some way of assessing some reason for the questions you ask and the interventions that you right. do. And I find that a lot of therapists don't have that don't have an they're just speech. operating on these like vague notions yep. of what is helpful yep. and often what sneaks in are cultural notions of right and wrong like well it's it's wrong to do this sort of thing instead of understanding the foundation that you're actually describing yeah. right now you know like like you shouldn't talk about your small complaints rather than understanding the foundation that would dictate whether or not that conversation is actually helpful or, right. um, to that problem. particular couple. But yeah, yeah so that's one way. Um, the other way, I, another question I might ask a couples therapist would be to say, to tell them what sort of uh, problem you're mainly uh, having and asking them what they would do. Another way to gauge is to have a session because you get a vibe for yeah. the way they listen. And yep. that would be hard to interview someone about, right? you know, to ask a couple of therapists, like how good of a listener are you? <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you're not going to get a picture of that. No. Um, and I find that, especially as I became more experienced, and I'm sure you're like this too, Bob, like I get into couple therapy within the first 30 seconds as they start, like, a couple will know what they're going to get from me very quick. There's not this long assessment phase of couple therapy. They, they'll they launch into stuff, and, and because the problems of couples is so – I mean, I hate to say this, but it's simple. You know, the kinds of problems, It's it, especially once you gain enough experience yeah. like you and I have, yeah. you see it a mile away. 
uh, and especially if you are able to ask a couple questions, you'd be like, so is this, is this what's happening for you? And I can figure couples out. I mean, I won't know all the nuances and all the issues and the flavors of the traumas, but it, it's there. It's so easy to see once you see it. The and, dynamic. Yeah. yeah. And so for me anyway, you would get a, a very quick idea of what sort of therapist I am. Anyway, yeah. uh, Lisa says, why do you think that these personality tests are so popular? Like just random personality tests. Wow. Is it because we like to hear our, is it because we like to hear about ourselves? Is it because we want answers as to why we behave the way that we do? I've always seen it as a big thirst to understand our nature. What do you think? What do you think about yeah, I think that's probably true. Um, and to understand our nature in a non-pejorative way, to be able to explain how we are in a way that doesn't say, well, you know, it's because I'm messed up or I'm selfish or I'm this, that, or the other. But to understand in a way that um, validates because we wish to feel good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually thought about this question earlier, and I have four reasons. One, yes, narcissism, which is normal. We're all interested in ourselves. Two is control over something that feels endlessly complicated mm -hmm. to us. Uh, three is, uh, you know, because if you can reduce everyone in the world to four or 16 or whatever, 12, yeah. 12 categories – it feels way more um, uh, doable in terms of understanding. You know, like with astrology, you meet someone oh, right. and you're feeling a bit unsure about what's happening. And then what I find people will do often is they'll figure out what astrological sign to be like, oh, I get it now. I, now I understand why this is happening. And, you know, so it, it feels comforting. Three is it can validate or justify things in ourselves and other people. People will say, well, I'm a Pisces, so that's why this is happening. Or I'm a ENFJ, and that's why this is happening. And that could be a good or a bad thing, obviously. And the fourth reason is that we love to categorize things. <laughs> like, yeah. We cannot help ourselves but to categorize. That's we're, true. We're const we clearly evolved to categorize um, and to adjust to our environment right it's like well that's a poisonous snake and that is not or right. that is something that you eat and that is something that's something you have sex with and that is something you don't <laughs> and obviously there's some benefits to that you know uh, i mean in uh one of the one of the very first things that adam and eve did was you know, Adam gave names to all, just quoting the Bible here, he gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. And I remember learning that as a kid, and right. that was a powerful idea that one of the very first things that we did as a human being on the planet was to name things. And so it's... Um, it's very comforting to us and a compulsion for us. We see a cloud, we want to, oh, it looks like a boat, even though it barely looks like a boat. Oh, We're always yeah, trying right. to fit things right. into our, our world. Nikki from Syracuse says, hi, Kirk and Bob. I'd really like to hear your thoughts on a therapist that I had. When I was 10, my emotionally abusive mother used therapy as a means to gaslight me, and the therapist seemed not to have noticed so there was a long story here, but basically the, uh, you know, just chiming in here on the email mm -hmm. or the submission, the therapist believed the mom's perspective that Nikki had an anger problem rather than seeing Nikki's anger as reactive to the mom's mistreatment of her. Okay. So the therapist, according to Nikki, was pathologizing the kid for having a normal reaction to abuse going on with the submission here. Mm. I spent my teenage years in constant, deep emotional pain that I felt like I couldn't do anything about because therapy never fully felt like a safe place to express my true self. I don't know if my therapist was so swayed by my mom because I was so young or if that's just how therapists treat young kids. Should my therapist have done things differently? Bob, what do you think? Based on what you're saying? Yeah, for sure. There, the, I... The, I would think that the idea is to understand the behavior in terms of its context and sort of 
um, not label it as pathologic, but to see it how is it how is this behavior caused by you know whatever factors there are in your family, and um, but just saying well you know this this child has an anger problem and obviously that's bad it doesn't really help anybody with anything mm-hmm. so I don't yeah yeah well I'm really sorry that happened to you Nikki that sounds awful yeah I. When I teach family therapists, one of the things that I will ask early in their instruction is I want you to think I'm going to present a case to you, or there's various different ways I'll ask this question, but one of the ways is I'll present a case in which you could potentially see it as the kid is the problem or the parent is the problem. And then I will ask them to just reflect on the case as I presented it and through a silent write as they're writing things down because I don't want them to influence each other. Right. And then I say, who do you think is primarily to blame? Who, who needs the most therapy? You know, and they, they talk about that and they're free, right? And then I will, without outing people, (laughs) I'll say some of you, you know, statistically will have answered that the kid is the problem. Some of you will think that the parents problem, Maybe some of you think that both people have issues. Maybe some of you think that neither of them have issues. I don't know. But this is your bias that you have to adjust for. Right. Because it, I have found in my experience that there are kid oriented, most family, most therapists are kid oriented people, but occasionally at, you know, 10, 20% of therapists are parent oriented people. And of course it's based on our own experiences. If you come from a family that had a really difficult sibling, for example, you're pr- and you were more on your parent's side, or you're a parent yourself and you have a very difficult child. Right. Y- you might be a little biased against kids in yeah. general mm-hmm. um, because you feel like everyone always blames you. Or oh, yeah. if you come from a family in which the parents are abusive and you've never really met a kid that generated problems from themselves. And it's interesting because you- you'll find these these Um, perspectives to be really dogmatic like you'll hear a story about um, and take it from me as a family therapist that dealt with like so many different kinds of families that obviously there are parents that are bad and parents that can cause bad behavior in, in children but there were some cases in which the parents were doing mostly okay and some kids just do some like wild stuff and are and are seemingly just making choices or going through a phase or something in which they're completely psychopathic and abusive towards their parents for seemingly no legitimate reason. And believe me, I was looking, you know, and I can never really know. And it's possible that there was something there, but, um, you know, I think there's a variety of influences on kids, disposition being one, but also outside influences. There would be kids that would be treated at, badly in society um, in a racist way or a mm-hmm. sexist way or something and they would turn to crime and once they get into a gang that can conv- it's like a cult and it convinces them that their parents are evil and then the kid starts using heroin and starts stealing from the parents and um, the parents try to intervene and the kid is violent with the parents uh, or the or the kid will invite their gang member friends to rob the house like Oof. as their home. I mean, I would see stuff like this happen. Yeah. And you you present those stories to a child biased therapist and they'll be like, "Well, the parents have to be to blame for something." And I'm just like, "Wow, like you 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 really can't see a situation in which a teenager can make their own choices. The, the kids can make their own choices. They Sometimes, you know, even younger kids can sometimes just decide to be jerks sometimes for, for a variety of reasons. It's usually because of something that happened, but not always, honestly, or at the very least the, to the extent that the kid is going, you know. Human beings have free will. They can do what they want, and that doesn't just start when you're 18, right? It starts when you're born, really, and yeah. develops over time. So um, things are complicated, and so... Uh, I don't know for you, Nikki, but it, it's possible that you ran into one of those therapists that was just like completely biased for parents because of their history or their training or something. Because to have an angry kid, <laughs> to have an angry teenager, 
Well, and that's another thing is that teenagers will present, generally speaking, as annoying. Like, not not saying you are annoying, Nikki, but if you spend time with enough teenagers, you you realize that they're not always pleasant to be around. They can be wonderful, wonderful human beings. And and I, I do enjoy hanging out with teenagers when it happens. But as a family therapist that worked with a lot of teenagers, I'm here to tell you that sometimes they can be extremely annoying. You know, for example, that kid that acted like he was sleeping the entire session. I mean, I was willing to just play cards with him. You know, it's just like, we don't even have to do therapy. We can, we can just play cards. Yeah. Actually, that's the client that taught me how to play 13. Oh, right on. Yeah. We, he taught you to play 13 and then took a nap. Yeah. Well, he eventually taught me 13 because <laughs> I eventually got him to open up. But oh, right on. so for those in the audience, uh, I this client taught me this East Asian game called 13. Really fun. There's a wide variety of different nuances to the rules, but I learned one version and taught it to my poker friends yeah. and we played it incessantly oh, we did. and still do play it. It's a very fun game. There's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of randomness. Uh, there's a lot of big, a lot of shit talking. A lot of dramatic <laughs> moments. Yeah, you don't need chips. You you can just nope. keep score of like who won and who lost. Right. You know? Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, I don't know if that's what happened to you, to you, Dicky, but um, yeah. And what I find is that true systemic thinkers are people that are like, well. Let's see how everything's working out within the system, right. you know? Let's see how how did they get here as a group of people without trying to place any blame. Yeah. That's true systems. All right, Brad from LA says, is it harder to treat BPD, borderline, when clients get older in age, 20s as opposed to 50s? Bob, what do you think? I don't think so. They say uh, around age 40 that the the intensity of borderline symptoms will settle some maybe our temperaments mellow a bit that's at least as i understand it the the theory behind the thing mm -hmm. but i haven't noticed that it's easier or harder to work with folks in their 20s or their 50s yeah i would say i don't yeah same i don't see any difference although i i will say that teens and 20s bpd i would say is an anecdotally harder mm -hmm. because of general lack of insight for that group and a uh, potential aversion to therapy in general right. that isn't necessarily there when you're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't uh, have hope for someone in their teens or 20s. No, no, not at all. Um, and research does show that um, there is more self-awareness and diminished sy symptoms of personality disorders as people get older. But at the same time, if you're in your 50s, you've had a lot more opportunities to get jaded and cynical because of your relationship history. Um, Leah says, no, wait. Brad from LA had another question. Are DBT skills the most essential thing for someone who has BPD to learn first to reduce their symptoms? Bob, what do you think? Great question. Uh, if you had asked that question 10 years ago, no, longer than that. The, the, the original wisdom with DBT is you got to get a person's um, behavioral impulses under control before you can do any trauma work that addresses, you know, some of the stuff that's behind the things that people do. And there's a researcher at UW, and now I think she works for the VA, um, called Melanie Harned, who wanted to see if that were really true. And so in first year of DBT, um, was doing prolonged exposure for um, people with PTSD. I think I think her population were women, but I don't know if that's true. If that's still true, anyways, um, could you do p prolonged exposure for um, uh, childhood trauma with people in the first year of therapy? And uh, I was a I was lucky. I was a, a skills trainer on her pilot study. So um, this was a group of 12 women who um, were willing to be research subjects in this thing. So all with borderline personality disorder, all with um, complex PTSD symptoms, and um, all um, with the potential to do prolonged exposure during the first year. That was what they were going to see if, if, they could, if they could even do it. Because, you know, the, the theory was... If you do that before somebody's ready, you'll kill them because you'll um, 
you'll um, turn the heat up on their uh, trauma responses, and that'll you know lead them to be more impulsive and the risk of death. I mean, certainly that is true with some people. Yeah. So, so, so she wanted to see if you could. Yeah, but do, but it depends on the client. Well, she could sell a car to Henry Ford, and what she used to say is, "We'll do PE, and we don't have anything else we know to do that's actually going to help you, but." not while suicide or self-harm are on the table, can't do it. And that was highly motivating. And so I've, I've taught DBT skills to hundreds of people over 25 years, 24 years of doing it. And that year was fascinating because as a group, there were 12 um, women in the group at the start and there were nine at the end, so three dropped out. Of those nine, what I noticed um, more than any other uh, population of folks I had ever taught DBT skills was this really beautiful equanimity. They went from really, really anxious, a lot of the, the you know the active PTSD stuff, to really sad and really angry, which you know are appropriate feelings that a person would have if they've been hurt in the ways that these women had. But there was this this lovely, lovely equanimity about them, acceptance of that which is. One of them said, I can't live this life anymore. And what she noticed was that she was scared of men everywhere, men are, who hurt her. She was scared of them everywhere. So if she were walking down the street and there were a man coming the other way, she'd cross the street. Or if she were waiting for the bus and a man came to the bus stop, she'd walk down to the next stop or till she, you know, that's like, wow. And she's like, I can't do that anymore. I can't. So she said, I'm living an exposed life where if I'm walking down the street and a man's coming, I'm just going to stay on my side. I'm just going to keep going. Just just keep going my way, not cross the street, not avoid. And she noticed that she was just by the end of that year able to do that with reasonable comfort and a sense of safety and freedom as a result. Because, man, PTSD, boy, is that a prison cell? Um, to actually m move around in the world. And she was not unique among that group they were they were remarkable they were ordinary too you know these are just you, you know there's ptsd there's there's borderline percent that's all over the place right that's everywhere in in the world and so it wasn't like there was anything unique or special about this particular cohort mm -hmm. except well the one controlling variable was did they or did they not engage in prolonged exposure mm -hmm. and all nine did all nine got somewhere and they were just lovely mm -hmm. in group. They mm -hmm. were just lovely, really mm -hmm. amazing too. Yeah, I mean, when I hear that, I hear a great story about people that were benefiting from the treatment model. I also, I'm guessing that the practitioners of the prolonged exposure PE were very good at their job yeah. and weren't just following the protocol, but were also empathetic and oh, yeah. adjusting to yeah. the clients yes, yes, and you know much. it wasn't just running them through the manual no, 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 no. and uh, also the clients were at a place where they were able to able. initiate with pe pretty quickly not every client is like that right um so overall what i hear is you can do that with some clients right and so to answer your question um uh from from my angle, Brad, is that, you know, are DBT skills the most essential thing for someone to do with BPD to first reduce symptoms? Uh, it's important to understand what DBT is, okay? DBT is emotional awareness and regulation. That's all that it is. It's a very good model of helping people to know their emotions and to regulate their emotions. It's it, you could describe it more than that, right? It's a it's acceptance of your emotions. Yeah, there's that. It's acceptance of yourself. It's acceptance of what is. You know, there's this. Uh, it's not just a simple, hey, accept your emotions. You know, there's a lot of wisdom angles to it. A lot yeah. of inspirational angles to it. But at its core, it is emotional awareness and regulation, skills and introspection and acceptance and practice and um, um, emotional containment from 
Bob and an individual therapist. And that's what it is at its core. It's specifically tailored for suicidality and perhaps borderline as well. But, it, you know, it, it could help anyone. All of us, if we go through DBT, will further our awareness of our emotions, our acceptance of our emotions, and our regulation of our emotions. We will all do that. So however you get there, whether it's through DBT or through CBT or just your own brand of emotional awareness and acceptance and regulation is how you get there. That's good for any client, particularly clients that have a lot of volatile emotions that can result in some pretty dire consequences like suicide. So is DBT the most essential thing? I would say no. no. The most essential thing is emotional awareness and regulation. <laughs> so, you know, and I think that DBT benefits by having a really good reputation because yeah. when people sign up for it, they feel like, well, this is going to work, mm -hmm. right? And there are treatment models. I think EMDR also benefits in this way. You know, yeah. people sign up for it already expecting right. it to work, and, right. and th that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Um, so, for example, for me, I don't do dbt yeah. but i do a lot of emotional awareness and regulation and it's tailored to the client and i'm guessing there are things that i do that are akin to it i i know that there are things in dbt that i don't even really come close to but in terms of the style of of that but yeah. um but yeah that's what i'll say about that and and that's important not only for the sort of triage elements of bpd but also to begin exposure because that's what's important for, you know, ha to have corrective experiences, you ha have to have either, you know, sort of classic exposure if you have classic traumas or more broad exposure to relational closeness without it being exploitative and with it being loving and helpful and safe. That corrective experience, that exposure, if you will, and having that neurological change as you go through that and learning that it's safe. and. The only way you can facilitate that as a therapist is if you have a, a, a free and fluid contact with the client's emotional state. And the only way you can do that is if the client knows their emotional state. And in order to intervene, you have to know that the client can regulate their emotions because you as a therapist cannot do that for them really. Even in session, you have to, you can help them to do it for themselves. And certainly in between sessions, they're not, you know, because they're going to be triggered all the time, yeah. whether it's by what you're doing in therapy or just life. Yeah. So that's my answer to that. Um, Leah says, how would you, how would your schemas be affected by repressed memories? I imagine that you would have an unexplainable part about yourself since the autobiographical memories don't support the psychological profile you're experiencing. What do you think, Bob? I have no idea. Yes. Well, it depends on what we mean by repressed memory. But if I were to give an example, there are plenty of people who, well, let's see. Can we use you for a second, sure, Bob? Because you're pretty, me. we've talked about this before, that your disorganized attachment developed in all likelihood, you know, zero to four. And although you have a very good memory, and I'm guessing, what's your earliest memory? Uh, standing at the foot of a hill, looking up. Uh, and that's, one of, that's one of my first, I have two first memories that are like that. I wonder if that's a universal thing that people. A sense that the grass is too tall to walk in, like it was hard to get my feet to move. How old were you? I believe I was about two. Yeah. I have a. And it's just a flashy, just a brief image. That's, yeah. Yeah. I have a, that's funny. I, I and was, also I saw you there. <laughs> I was two as well. I had to have been because we moved from that house when I was two and a half. Or even I could have been one and a half or something. And I was looking up this staircase that, because my parents rented the upstairs of a house. Oh. And there was this outdoor staircase like Fonzie had. And, oh, yeah, yeah, right on. And I, I remember I was looking up that staircase and I, I saw this light sconce and... I'm looking at up and I'm just like, oh, it's going to take me so long to get up there. <laughs> I just remember. You weren't wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it was just one story uh -huh. of, of stairs, but I just was like, oh, this is, okay, got to get ready for this. And then one of my other first memories was when I was at the bottom of the hill and we were in Spokane and me and my family were going back up to the car and 
I just could not get up the hill. I just thought, oh, it's going to be so hard. And I told my parents and my family um, all got around me and gave me a pep talk. And I shot up the hill before. I, <laughs> hey! and I, and I remember feeling that sense of how my family, my attachments could change my physiology like that. Because right in on. one moment I, I couldn't, I didn't have enough energy. And no. then the next moment I had more than enough energy. It's like, that's weird, you know? That's cool. Um, Great story. But anyway, so for you, when you were zero to two, I don't know if we talked about this, but do you have any conceptualization of what the quality of your relationships, your attachments were, you know, at, at 12 months that would uh, help that would contribute to the development of disorganized or preoccupied attachment no memory of that though i have two older sibs and um i clearly was observing their interactions with my with you know among my family so but i don't have any memory of any of that have you been told as to what it was like no. could you matt do you have an idea of what it was like because usually back then, and to some extent now, but particularly back then, dad's working out of the house. Oh, yeah. And mom is the primary yep. holder and, and caregiver and parent. Yep. And so the, that quality of relationship is very impactful on our attachment style, obviously. Right. And with disorganized attachment, it's usually the result of the attachment figure is, is also dangerous, dangerous somehow. Yeah. So do you have any kind of... Uh, speculation as to how that would have what that would have looked like I could speculate but based on memory of life when I was older and have you know the still little like you know six seven whatever um, during my dad's a CPA during tax season he would work long long days like that would be like you were born in tax tax season no I was born in May so, well, that's kind of tax season, right? Yeah. His busy time would have ended by mid-April. Oh. And um, he would be gone about two months of the, you know, you know, February to April. He'd be working these really long killer hours. And so he'd be, he would be come, come home at like eight or nine at night. And um, it was easier. It was, it felt safer. And I can still hear the sound of his wingtip shoes, very heavy shoes, uh, coming up the walk. and Meaning you were born in a time when it was not safe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. So your dad was more involved as a parent, perhaps, when you were born. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that he was a scary guy, uh, I think, pretty much the whole time. Yeah, okay. So... You remember that having that feeling when you're six or seven, so you could extrapolate backwards. And, yeah, that's it. And know that maybe when you were 12 months, you had a similar, similar feeling, maybe yeah. worse because you're younger and have, have less power. Right. And so this attachment figure, your, your dad was a secure base because he's your father and you're attached to him, but he's also the scary monster and you don't know to go to him or away from him because that's the instinct and that's yeah. what that's the basis for a disorganized attachment. Yeah. So... To answer uh, Leah's question, it's like, uh, do we call these repressed memories or do we just call them non-encoded memories or pre-verbal memories or inaccessible memories? Um, and whatever we call them, uh, these are memories-ish experiences. And how can those things that you can't remember affect your psychological profile? Well, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. Right? Like neurons... Yeah. That fire together, wire together. Lots yeah. of neurons are. Yeah, I mean, hardly any of us can remember how we learned the syntax of our native language, right? I don't remember. Uh, it was modeled to us, and we learned it. You know, there's there's subject, verb, object kind right. of thing. And yet we all do it automatically. Right. Um, the f you know, how is that? Does that mean that it's just a theory that we learned syntax? No, we all understand that we absorbed syntax. Yeah. It's not an automatic thing that we're born with you know we are born with a template that is available to language and then it gets imprinted on by whatever we see and attachment is the same way and and anyway anonymous says bob do you ever struggle with friendships given your attachment style and severity how did you overcome this bob what do you think struggle with friendships what does it mean do you think 
Um, I'm guessing Anonymous was saying, like, do you have that kind of um, complication that disorganized individuals can have where, and you've talked about this a lot, you know, in terms of Butler syndrome and, yeah. and that, but um, maybe what Anonymous is saying, well, you described how you get triggered by Colleen and there can be a intense conflict cycle there. Oh yeah. yeah. They can get you intense. Can, you know, get real triggered and then pretty distorted and then perpetually upset and mm. then, um, you know, entrenched in that whatever you want to call it. And maybe Anonymous is saying, do you ever do that with your friends? I can't say that happens with my friendships. I'd say that, you know, everybody's attachment style is going to show up in the way they interact with people. But um, I love my friends. And I get a lot out of my relationship with my friends. I'd say the biggest problem I have with my friends is I don't see them as much as I want to. And, you know, that's that's on me, really. That's that's not because I wouldn't be welcome. And actually, quite the opposite. Every time I'm around, it, my friends, I, they seem to be very glad to see me. And I get to enjoy them. And I enjoy a certain amount of wildness and obnoxiousness and play. And um, my friends are... <laughs> often willing to come along and play and um i enjoy their company and uh learning about what's going on in their worlds and um yeah i, I the things that happen to me in my in my like in my marriage or whatever um they don't they don't really occur with my friends mm -hmm. yeah there's not really anything to overcome no. you're just less triggered no. and i wonder if it has to do with your siblings not being a source of triggering as a kid could be you know my sibs are really really great you know when my father passed they i just well, i went back east i was we were there for a week and i did a, i just observed them in their interactions with one another and there was a tremendous amount of kindness and decency and flexibility they were just lovely and i thought you know if i just knew these people just because i met them I want to be friends with them. They're really just really cool. Let's do one more, Bob. All right. And we got like half of the way through. And this okay. doesn't even, or maybe more than half. Mm -hmm. This also doesn't include the emails that have been piling up. Oh, boy. <laughs> Mimi says, I got broken up with over three years ago. Mm. It was my first boyfriend. Mm. We were together for two years, ages 17 to 19. Oh, wow. Time is not making it better for me. Mm. And so this is three years ago. And I still haven't been able to move on or start dating again. I haven't had contact with him in two years and mm -hmm. have even moved across the country. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how to move on or not feel intense hurt and jealousy over the fact that he's been dating his new girlfriend since three months after we broke up oh. and they're still together. Yeah. I've been on three first dates since, and all were just dull, and I couldn't get him out of my mind. Right. Bob, what do you think? I think Mimi hasn't accepted that that relationship is over and is um, probably resisting her grieving. So um, be, you moved across the country, so you're not seeing... There are things that are probably triggering your your memory of him or that bring him into awareness or your thoughts or whatever. Um I can only relate to this based on my own experience of this sort of thing. And yeah, I was going to say, there's a, a, a. I was wondering if that's where you were going. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Yeah. The, the this would have been, what, 25 years ago or something? Oh, yeah, a while back, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah 25, 19, late 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and then the early 2000s, and that sort of went on. Um, what would I be doing if I were accepting that that relationship is over? And an emphasis on the word is. Meaning that's what she could ask herself. She could ask, Mimi could ask herself. What would what, I be doing if I accepted that this was that over, this truly over? is over. over. So in the times when I'm pining for my ex, I would stop pining. When I, me, it was cars. I'd see that car. Right. Um, White Subaru or something? No, uh, that was Colleen's car. Oh. Um, uh, black, Honda. Black Honda Civic hatchback. Right. They're everywhere. Or they were anyways back then. Are they mm -hmm. still everywhere? They probably are. You know, they don't really make hatchbacks anymore, Honda. Mm -hmm. are, are you talking about like, so you're talking about like a 90s model. Yeah. Was a flatback, that flatback Civic. 
It's like a boxy square back. No, no, the round the the next the, the next one up was rounded. The I rounded. remember the boxy one. So hatchback, so more kind of a sloped back. And then, oh, sorry, like rounded. a little little station wagon kind of thing. Yeah, 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 little. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I don't think they make that anymore. Oh well, yeah, I don't I don't look for it anymore. Yeah. So um, for me, it was what well, what would I be doing when I see one of those cars? Well, I turn my face back where I'm going and I go where I'm going, and on with it right mm -hmm. so well what else did you do because did you talk about it a lot no i never talked about it i think i remember you talking about it with me well i only talked about it i talked about it a little bit when it happened but it went on for six years yeah and i didn't talk about it at the end did you talk about it in, in therapy yeah i talk about it in therapy did you think about it and process the feelings during that six years I thought about it a lot, and I pined a lot. Yeah. Did you cry about it? I did not cry about it. Um, I mostly was sort of depressed about it. I was living with the Todd back then. Mm -hmm. He was really, I, to, I would talk to him about it sometimes. He was really decent about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. One time he's following me down the freeway, and I, I was looking across the valley there over by the, what do they call the Ship Canal Bridge, uh, toward the apartment and he's following me behind me in that remember that red Miata he used to have mm -hmm. and uh, I big look at guy my, little car yeah yeah big guy he he lugged a full size door in that thing he just stuck it in the passenger seat it took took the top down and then just grabbed hold of it and drove it wherever he needed to go with it he's really I mean, anyways he's he caught me looking across the valley there uh, towards wherever the apartment we used to share was and he just he just shook his head he's like no bobby you don't do that and um uh but really good he's a good guy um uh but but i think the thing that shifted it was i i had to accept that it is over the ship canal bridge are you talking about i-90 yeah uh no no uh, i-5 yeah Go i-5 sorry wa I wallingford right right around wallingford right i'm sure uh, so you were on the sh oh you're on the ship canal bridge and you're looking West, um, west, northwest towards Wallingford because yeah. you can kind of oversee Wallingford. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember you sort of lived in that on that slope. Yep, that's right. Yeah, upstairs, kind of had a Fonzie. A fun, it was definitely a Fonzie yeah. apartment. Yeah, yeah. And there's a tree outside that I climbed. That you climbed and with her necklace her on. Necklace on. <laughs> um, and I jumped out of the tree and it snagged. And on you the, left the necklace. <laughs> and the necklace just shattered and all the beads. Oh. It was it was a very elaborate. <laughs> like hundreds of different kinds. It was a very chaotic necklace. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, I was one of those obnoxious people that if you had something in your bathroom, I was going to put it on or yep. something. Yeah, anyway. Yep. Yeah. Well, what I'll say, Mimi, in addition to that is grief. You're going through grief. One is there is nothing unusual about three years after the fact, still struggling. Yeah. You... We're together for two years, 17 to 19, maybe. So he was your first boyfriend, you yeah. said that, which means that this was a big deal. Yeah. Well, it'd be a big deal at any time in your life, but it can be particularly a big deal then. I mean, first boyfriend. The, the amount of openness that we can have when we fall in love for the first time. All the, everything's new, exploring all that stuff, learning about stuff, sharing yeah. it. Newness, but also the trust level like uh -huh. i i went through this when i was a teenager the amount of just unbridled trust because it you've never been through it and been hurt by it exactly. so it's like there's no holding back nope. potentially and yeah. and you just hand everything oh. over and when it doesn't work out it's particularly painful oh yeah you know and it's a it's a realization and you know mimi i've said this on the podcast before but i remember one of the very first axioms i developed when before i decided to want to be a therapist but i had all these little sayings that i would say my friends would make fun of me they called them ks's kirk sayings and one of them was you're not a real person until you get dumped oh yeah because when you get and because i had experienced that that there was me before I had had that experience right. and there was me after. And the me after was a very different person. The me after was 
understanding of like how this whole thing worked, you know, and before I had fallen in love and been dumped, I was a child in a lot of ways. I was naive to the whole thing. And I'm not saying that the lesson is like, you, you got to be jaded, but the lesson is like the, the kind of delusional and fantasy and handing yourself over, you know, the ro- the, the Disney version of falling in love, just that whole thing. And I don't know if that's what you went through, Mimi, but either way, um, it could be massively intense in two years, even just two, two weeks of that is massively oh, yeah. intense, but two years, it's a big deal. Yeah. So to be suffering three years later is totally normal and to be, and to have difficulty dating and to be thinking of him totally normal mm-hmm. and to, to hurt when you know that oh, he yeah. is with someone else um, and he's, and he's been with her for three years, three years. Uh, longer than he was with you. That's that's incredibly painful. Yeah. To not feel that pain is to not be a human being. It's not probably going to last. Now, along the lines of what Bob is saying is you might be experiencing what some might call complicated grief, which is the grief is being complicated somehow. Your grieving process is getting derailed or prevented or hindered in some way or influenced and it's it's hard to know uh, if i knew more i'd be able to determine or i'd, I'd have a conceptualization because there's a possibility that you that you're grieving well and it's just painful there's also another possibility that you're stuck because of some something that's getting in your way either self-judgment or that's why i was asking bob like did he talk about it in therapy did he talk about it with his friends did he feel the feelings because those are the things you want to ask yourself Am I processing mm-hmm. the the loss? Am I talking about it? Am I shaming myself? Are people shaming me? Mm-hmm. Am I allowed to feel the feelings? You might even want to, depending on things, have some interactions with him. You know, you said you haven't had contact with him in two years, and uh, I don't know what it looks like, but uh, there's a version of your grief that might even involve contacting him that could have some ups and downs. I'm not recommending that, of course. I'm recommending therapy, to be specific. But there's a possibility that going through a few months where, you know, you talk with him on the phone or something, and again, you'll have some ups and downs. It'll potentially reemerge. Again, I'm not recommending this, but I'm just saying there's a there's a road that of grief that could involve that. And um, so there that's that's my reaction it's like it's normal it's fine yeah. nothing wrong with that you're not broken and i'll say that along the lines of along the lines of what we were saying earlier i went to therapy when i was 19 kind of because of what you're talking about what you went through maybe oh, that i yeah. i was like am i broken now like yeah. there's some i feel like i'm broken there's something wrong with me mm. and i wanted to talk about it but my friends were terrible listeners <laughs> and yeah. so uh, and one of my other friends said that he had been to therapy and it felt good. And so I was like, well, okay, I'll pay $15 to have a professional listen to me. And it did help. Mm-hmm. It didn't solve my problems, mm-hmm. but it, it did help. It mm-hmm. did satisfy something. And I stopped trying to get my terrible friend. I mean, they're good people, my friends, but <laughs> terrible listeners. And so my friends back then. Um, so I, it, I went through that. That that's that's what happened to me, um, and you could argue that my grief process about my high school relationship lasted a really long time. Uh, probably, I don't know, five, ten years ish or something, maybe seven years. But it, it was pretty intense for the first three or four years. Yeah. Longing, pining, yeah. thinking, mm. interfering with dating, uh, feeling like I'm never going to move on. But I did, <laughs> you know. Um, there's still echoes, and I'm friends with her. And I was just thinking about her the other day, actually. So, you know, it, it and that was uh, 35 years ago. <laughs> You know, that was actually, it was the year that Bob went to therapy. That's, that's when I went through my breakup in in high school. Yeah. That's a, that's a day or two ago. 
Um, I'm sorry, Mimi. Yeah. Mimi. Yeah. Grieve. Allow yourself. Get people that let yourself do that. Go to therapy and, you know, create, yell, cry, laugh, um, you know, do all the things because you deserve it. And everyone out there, that does it for that episode. And take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>